I remember the, the, the day I got there, it was, it, it was whale, uh, Hermanus is the whale watching, land-based whale watching capital of the world, or so it calls itself, and it certainly seemed to be that way. And I, was, I had a few minutes before I had to go inside and start talking to folks, and I was looking out at the bay, and this um, eccentric fella came to me and said, would you like the whales to come in so you could see them better? And I said, sure, okay. You know, I didn't believe him, but I wanted to humor him. He took out this horn, which he had made out of kelp and lacquer, and blew it, and it bellowed, and <laughs> some of the whales swam in towards me. And one of them spouted. They were huge, beautiful southern right whales. And it, it hit me at that moment that, you know, the, the whales use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate from Antarctica to Hermanus, where they have their young, and then they, you know, they go back out and sure. the sea. And I'm sure birds do, and everything else. Yeah, and you know, it was it was an emotional moment because I mean, look, there's a lot greater devastation than than whales losing their way, but it just drove the point home to me that how interconnected and how you know this this invisible field that I hardly ever think about in daily life is is so important to so many creatures whom we adore or depend on vitally. Um, and when I talked to the scientists, I spent a, you know, a couple of days in and out of the lab there with them. They were concerned that the Earth's magnetic field might be undergoing the beginnings of a pole shift, and that is where the, the magnetic poles of the Earth switch, they flip. It doesn't mean that they geographically move from one end to the other. Like there's a movie that was out called 2012 where the whole Earth's crust starts sliding yeah, around. Yeah, they make it look like that thing's flipped over. Yeah, no, that's not the deal. I mean, you know, that, that was that was maybe good Hollywood, but it's not science. And um, so they're worried that they think that every 70,000 years or so, the magnetic poles flip and, and the magnetic field, therefore, s s switches dramatically. And the, there's this is a, happens in the natural course of things, but it takes a couple thousand years for this to accomplish, the scientists believe. And, and while it's happening... The, the whole magnetic field decreases in strength, and you actually have multiple poles popping up, more than two, and they pop up in odd places. Um, so I thought this was interesting and, and, you know, notable, and I wrote it up in my, my book and didn't think too much about it. It seemed like we may be enduring in the beginnings of such a shift, but it didn't seem imminently catastrophic. Fast forward to, again, December 2008, when... A squadron of five NASA solar research satellites, the squadron was called Themis, flew unexpectedly through a gigantic breach in the Earth's magnetic field, a pole to equator hole in the Earth's magnetic field. They were so shocked, the astrophysicists from NASA who, 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 who monitored this, they were so shocked that the project leader said it was as though the sun rose in the west. And... As, as regards 2012, one of the, the the scientists went on to describe. He, he claims that he claims very seriously that, that we are in the the perfect position for a really big event here on Earth, because the magnetic field is going down. The shields are down, Scotty. We don't know why. It was it was. Uh, it, 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 I've never seen so many exclamation points in a NASA research article. Right. Um, but we, we do know that the, the shield is, is, is way down. We're heading towards the solar climax of 2012. And now with the National Academy of Sciences findings that that solar climax could knock out our power grid, we are really in a situation here. So, you know, I don't know if you're a religious man or given to praying. I'm, but, I'm spiritual. Yeah, well, let the spirit guide our our leaders to – protect our power grid. I don't mean to harp on that one thing, but it's the one thing we can do, and it's a, it's a terrible, terrible tragedy if we don't. No, I, it, I agree. And this magnetic field shift will have ramifications for species, for, um, for skin cancers, because the, the, the field protects us from these solar radiations. I, I just can't believe they're not jumping all over this right now, Lawrence. That's, that's what boggles my mind. You know, um, I've got a a 3,000 word article coming out tomorrow in Huffington Post and um, on this subject. And I'm hoping, you know, I, I guess it's selective perception. I, I don't know if, if, if Huffington Post is in enough to be read and, and regarded, but I don't know. Maybe you know. with this show and that, maybe something will start. 
Well, with, with your, you know what's what's great because I'm going to ask your listeners uh, to to really do something that maybe they find a little bit boring or distasteful, but just write your senator. We've done that. We've done that. We've blitzed the White House with emails. You know, Richard Hoagland's come on before saying do this to, because of NASA issues and things like that, and it's worked. Well, f- fantastic. I know you've got a large and loyal following, so, mm-hmm. you know, don't have to mention me. Just <laughs> <the power laughs> yeah, Please, grid. right? All right, then, then let's say you, you went to South Africa to check on the magnetic field. Then you went to Siberia. What did you go there for? Oh, my Lord, that was uh, a, a fantastic trip. Um I had read the work of a a man named Dr. Alexei Dmitriev, who claims that um, the solar system, the sun and all its planets, is moving into an interstellar energy cloud. And this this cloud of energy um, is exciting the atmospheres of the outer planets and of the sun. And when it excites the sun, um, it has impact on uh, all other planets, including Earth. Hence, maybe global warming. Hence, maybe global warming, and hence also uh, increased seismic and volcanic activity. Mm-hmm. So, you know, at, at first, I thought I was, uh, frankly, I was snobby about it. I mean, I, I live in, in sunny California, and I thought, you know, this guy's in Siberia. If I lived in Siberia, I'd be waving a red flag, too. You know, I thought, well, maybe, you know, it just seems kind of a, a doomed thing to say. And it took me months to get him to agree for me to come visit. His, I'd call with the interpreter on the line all booked up, you know, and yeah. his wife would say, well, he's out researching thunderstorms. He'll be back in a month. I thought like, either the guy's a flake or he's giving me a runaround. But finally I got him to agree to, that I would meet at a conference. And I went to Siberia, a place called Novosibirsk, which is the capital. But it actually was in a, a, a research installation called Akadem Gorodok, which was a secret scientific research city that had been founded uh, after Stalin fell by the Soviets. It was not exile. It was a place to sequester military physicists primarily, uh, but they were given more freedoms, more amenities, and better research facilities than they, than they would have had anywhere else. And the reason why is they, from Siberia they couldn't defect to the West, and, and Western spies couldn't get in there. You know, it's just right. that remote. Trapped. So now uh, Akadem Gorodok is, is opening up to the West because, you know, capitalism has, has trumped the, gold war, the Cold War. Um, and a lot of their secrets are becoming, you know, we're, we're getting to see what's going on. It was a fantastic, incredibly advanced place out in the middle. I mean, really, out in the middle of nowhere. And when I got there, I realized that this fellow was putting me off, not because he's a flake or whatever, but because he was the celebrity scientist there. There was a conference. There were probably 100 scientists from around the world, everywhere but from the United States. Um, I don't know why that was, but I noted that fact. And he was the one that everyone was sidling up to and trying to show research to or get an autograph on his latest book. And, uh, you know, I, I acquired importance simply by standing next to him. So I thought, okay, you know, at least this is this is good and interesting, and the man is his opinion is valued by his peers. And so I wrote about the moving into the um, solar the solar system moving into the interstellar energy cloud. And I asked him, I said, "Well, you know, how long are we going to be in this cloud?" Uh, he said he didn't know, but if he if he had a guess, he'd say, "Oh, two or three thousand years." Jeez. Well, I knew we'd been in a cloud, Lawrence, <laughs> but I didn't know it was one like this. Yeah. And and I said, "Well, what?" Um, what what are the practical implications for us now here uh, of this cloud? And he, he, he paused for a moment, and I, I knew from his resume that he'd won the Soviet Medal for uh, Earth Science um, in, in the beginning of his career. Yeah. And he said, global catastrophe, as he put it, not in tens, but in ones of years. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. well, that's not too good. Um, but... Uh, it was still more anecdotal and discountable because, you know, I, I, it's a colorful little story about going to Siberia and, and this and that. And this scientist, no matter how esteemed he happened to, been, happened to be, was not the prevailing orthodoxy. Well, fast forward to Christmas Eve, December 24, 2009, and Nature magazine, probably the most prestigious scientific publication in the world, publishes an article by three American and one Russian scientist saying exactly what Dmitriev had been saying for 15 years, that we have indeed moved, begun to move into an interstellar energy cloud. 
and they both use the same source, Voyager spacecraft data. 